Okay, so I prepared for a talk story uh, roundtable, <laughs> uh, responding to four questions. Um, so I'm just gonna wing it and we can sort of go from there. Um, the work that I, I'm doing right now is, as I said, thinking about a genealogy of the present, right? So how is it that we get to um, this point in time, thinking about the situation of American Samoa, thinking about Samoan communities in the United States, thinking about the importance of uh, football in Samoa and Samoans in American football. And so um, this is a, a genealogy of the sport in the community, but it's also, um, there's a portion of it, um, I think the article I have in here, considers you know, my own genealogy in relation to this kind of development of the sport and then what it means in terms of thinking about mobility. Um, and so there are three things um, I, I want to mention and then I'll talk a little bit more about the specific kind of gendered um, sexualized aspect of um, the chapter that I'm writing right now actually. Um, so the three things, uh, first, uh, thinking about cultural, Samoan cultural sensibilities and the reasons and the ways that people move. And so um, here I bring in some of the training uh, that I had as a graduate student in anthropology, but then also some of the work in Pacific studies. So Sa'ili so Lilo Maya, doctor's work on um, Samoan um, sort of concepts of movement um, and of course, Damon Salas' work on the longer history of Samoan movement, right? So placing this kind of sport migration within this longer history of labor migration, uh, movement within the Pacific, movement beyond the Pacific, but also thinking about how uh, things like empire shape the possibilities for movement, right? Um, so putting together an attention for, or attention to cultural sensibilities with empire and industry, Right, so if any of you saw, um, there was a 60 minute segment uh, in 2010 that ran, it's still online, you can find it, um, and it was called Football Island. And as he, uh, the correspondent begins the segment, um, and most of it is based in American Samoa, he begins the segment talking about um, someone's being 56 times more likely to make it to the NFL than any other ethnic group. Um, I've never actually seen that data. Some of the recent data, uh, some of the recent um, calculations that we did for a film that just came out um, estimate that Samoans and Tongans are 26 times more likely, so still uh, per capita, um, but not quite the 56 uh, number that I've heard repeated uh, by the youth themselves, which is really interesting, right? So it begins that, and so you think about, okay, how, did, how is it that we have this kind of hyper-visibility in this sport? Um, and so thinking about the connection between Samoan migration to the U.S. and the rise of um, the American sports industry, in particular football, right, starting um, really in the 1970s, um, if we're thinking about the amount of money that is involved uh, ev everywhere from youth sports to high school sports, college sports, professional, um, the media, merchandising, all of that kind of stuff, um, it's fairly recent um, as these developments go. So think about the connection uh, between being able to travel on a US, US passport to Hawaii, right? So of course the migration route, the territorial status, empire, um, cultural sensibilities, and then mediated images. So this is the, the chapter that um, I'm working on right now. I'll tell you guys a little bit about. And it's centered on um, trying to deconstruct this vision of the natural Samoan athlete, sort of natural, right, in quotes, um, in the figure of the gridiron warrior. And so there is a quote from a 1976 Sports Illustrated article that um, starts, is trying to kind of mark the critical mass of Samoan, specifically Samoan players um, on the gridiron fields of uh, the continental, Hawaii and the continental US at that moment in 1976. Um, and it says, uh, what is coming on is not your uh, regular run of the, run of the reef uh, gin mill flamethrowers, but uh, six to seven feet tall affect the sides 
affect the tides large. Um, and I forget, he, as if they've uh, stepped out of a museum of oceanic antiquities, which indeed they have, from American Samoa, and sort of goes on and on about uh, racial purity and um, not never having their land taken and all that kind of stuff. So um, I kind of start from this piece and put it together with um, some of the promotional t materials with the Polynesian Power uh, documentary that came out in, I think, I think 2004, in terms of what is this icon of the Pacific Islander, um, or at that point it was someone as Polynesian, right? Someone standing in for all Polynesians. Uh, now it's a little bit more broad in terms of actual participation. Um, but this vision of the kind of brown, um, muscled body with the long curly hair and the tattoos, right? Um, that gets sort of repeated um, in and circulated in mainstream media, right? So in, in part thinking about what are the mainstream media representations of someone in Pacific Islander um, football players, right? Um, and then trying to uh, sort of peel apart what are some of the assumptions about culture, um, about background um, of the different players and the way they all get sort of consolidated into one vision of this um, native Polynesian. Um, sporting figure. And so in looking at this, of course, you know, been um, uh, inspired by, you know, Ty's work on um, Native Hawaiian masculinities, and then, of course, Vince Diaz's work um, on football in the Pacific, and Brendan Hokufitu's work on Maori um, in rugby in Aotearoa. So thinking about the way these ideas about culture come together with ideas about race, right, in the body, and um, assumptions about masculinity, right, and particular performances of masculinity. Um, so bringing those things together. So it's been, um, so, you know, again, what I mentioned about the contradiction, right, so um, not just reading this as a commodity form, right, that gets sort of produced and then is used to sell teams and gear and um, sell to the fans, right, sort of fan loyalty, um, but also the ways in which uh, this vision of uh, the great iron warrior is appealing, right, becomes sort of important, becomes a, a point of attachment for some of the youth. So um, thinking about the uh, recent beginning of the Polynesian Football Hall of Fame and the importance of really um, highlighting the success that different Polynesian players have had um, in the NFL and what that has meant to, you know, Hawaiian communities, local um, communities across the board, Samoan communities, Tongan communities, etc. cetera. Um, things like the Polynesian All-American Bowl um, in LA, which is really a labor of love, trying to uh, provide different kinds of opportunities for college access, for showcasing um, Polynesian youth um, not just from uh, the Los Angeles area, now they sort of branched out, but the high school players, right, sort of uh, showcasing them. Um, so there is a way that this, the figure of the gridiron warrior has provided um, a kind of a positive script of masculinity, I think for, especially for uh, diasporic. Uh, someone and other Pacific Islander youth who otherwise might be stereotyped as gang members or, you know, violent or um, you don't want to walk next to them on the street or, you know, s stuff like that, you know, racist, discriminatory kinds of stereotypes. And so um, this possibility of success in sport becomes a really um, resonant and sort of meaningful way um, to gain status, to gain access to um, educational opportunities, et cetera, right? At the same time that there is, uh, for many Samoan families, a deep genealogical connection, right? Sort of uh, following in the footsteps of uncles and cousins, uh, older brothers, you know, as I said before. Um, and so in this, um, in the figure of the gridiron warrior trying to think about what are the effects of having this as the main way that our youth, our male youth get talked about? And um, do we have the same kinds of ideas circulating, for example, with uh, Samoan 
uh, female uh, sports uh, persons, and of course no, right? So there is an important gendered component to this. There is an important assumption about heterosexuality. Um, all you have to do is look at the whole Manti Teo case and the huge sort of um, uh, media storm that got generated, right, to think about uh, the ways you have uh, prescriptive heterosexuality, you have um, different attachments or different ideas about culture, what it means um, to be part of a warrior tradition in the Pacific. Um, but I think if you look at this from um, standing in the Pacific, from standing in Hawaii, um, it inspires you to ask different kinds of questions, and so you don't leave it just at the kind of media analysis narrative. Um, instead, really thinking about uh, what does it mean to the communities, what does it mean to the families, what does it mean to the young players themselves, and that um, helps us to um, rethink both the kind of positive aspects about it, but particularly, I think, when we're talking about gender, there are some negative aspects. Um, and I'll just end um, sort of sharing with you when I've given more full presentations about the project and the research, um, having you know some of the young college students or high school students come up afterward, you know, and um, share about feeling completely stereotyped as you know only a sports player, only a football player, um, being treated differently by faculty members, by other students. Um, having particular kinds of expectations, both from people within the community and outside of the community, um, in the ways that sort of channeled them in the sport route, um, but wasn't also channeling, or wasn't also challenging them um, for other kinds of career potentials, for um, really thinking about them as uh, beyond their capacity as football players, right? And so in thinking about what are some of the, the drawbacks of this kind of um, an icon, um, that's one that's been shared with me actually from some of the years. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you so much.